Thank you very much, Finette. And uh, I would like to thank Finette especially for inviting me. And, you know, she's done so much with, with doing uh, Tribal Amsterdam. And I, I can remember her, the Le Maire Gallery going back generations when I was in my 20s, the first time I visited it, when Amsterdam was a pulsating center of tribal, tribal art. I'd also uh, like to thank Case Zwartenkot, who has also played such an incredible role, not only in, in Holland in, in promoting uh, tribal art, but also around the world with his books. And I'm very proud that he felt uh, you know, motivated to include this book because he's done many books on curses and weapons of, of Indonesia. Uh, finally, two other names I would like to thank for their, for their enthusiastic support for the project are Arnold Wentholt, uh, who I've known for many years. We've worked together several times, and Raymond Corbe, who has, I think, a distinct and very interesting take on, on tribal art, which shows that there's more to be learned than we have uh, seen often in the past. So the first thing I wanted to talk about before I start showing some photos is uh, why, why, uh, why Chris's? What, what, what do I have to do with Chris's? Well, the first time I ever saw Chris was in 1964 when I was 12 years old at the New York World's Fair. And it was an astounding uh, experience, the total, uh, the exotic, uh, views and all the sculpture and everything else I saw there. And the second time uh, I was truly inducted into the world of the Chris and Indonesian art was at the Tropen Museum in Amsterdam, having arrived in Amsterdam just after uh, university and being also uh, transported to a magical world. And finally, when I really experienced Chris's directly was when I arrived in, in Indonesia the first time in 19, 1975. And it was, uh, again, one of those things because it was not only seeing it in a showcase, it was not only reading about it in a book, it was actually seeing what the Chris's role was in Indonesian society at that time, which was still strong, particularly in Bali. Uh, we just had the, the day uh, in which they give all the offerings uh, not, not too long ago, around two weeks ago, in which we make sure that all the Chris's get fed in order to prevent them from, from being dangerous. And, and, and because Chris is, as we know, a very, very special object. So I've had a, a long relationship to Chris's and, and there's always been this mystical, the, the, the Chris and the Malay uh, world. However, even though that's always intrigued me uh, as do those kind of stories like Louis Copernicus uh, with the Stella Krach and with uh, other people, there's all kinds of stories that we hear about it running amok and, and the Pandey caste, this special caste, which has been around even before the Hindu Buddhist period, the, the smiths, the ones that when they hold their tools of trade in hand, they have to be addressed as if they're gods because they're believed to be actual manifestations of, of, of God. But my, my relationship to Chris's was a little bit different and that's relevant to the book that, uh, that we made here. And that is because I'm, I'm, I'm always been, as, as somebody who's interesting in art, I'm interested in the plastic arts, the sculpt sculptural features, the idea of object art, in particular, the hilts of Chris's, which I feel are comparable to Netsky's and other, forms of miniature sculpture. And I also feel that these mirror the historical development of sculpture in Indonesia in its great diversity, because there are, are many, they come from the tribal period. We see it with animal forms and, and, and stylized forms. Then we go to the Hindu Buddhist period in which we see, see gods. We also see Rakshasa demons and other ones coming out. And then there's also other 
animals and 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 beasts and all sorts of magical magical forms and in that sense the, the curses that you see in this book are just that i'm going to start showing uh sh showing some of the photos so you you can look here at a number of the pictures. So we look at here. This is this is a Chris, which is uh, from 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 Java. And if you look at the, these cloud motifs, which are Hindu Buddhist in religion, they're also very comparable to the Megamendum, the cloud motifs that you see in in Bat, uh, Batik from Cherubon and other places like that. This is this is a Chris which is of solid gold. It's cast. It's it's not it's not soldered together like some Chris's are, and it's very 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 heavy. And it's uh, it it dates back because this is the sort of thing. How do you how do you date these things? You date them by looking at the sculpture at that time. If you look at the Kasu, uh, the doors in if you know in the Kasupuhan Palace in Cherubon, you'll see motifs like this from doors, which are definitely from the Majapahit period. And, uh, and so you, you, you get involved with that. These are also, this is a Chris, uh, Chris also, which you find all over Northern Java. It's said to be the son, the, the, the son of, uh, of, of Krishna, the Samba. It could also be Panji. Panji is is a uh, is a hero uh, who's who's also considered to be an incarnation of of, of a god, and uh, his tales are are very very strong. And here you see the remarkable work, the fil filigree work, and then we can start talking about how the the different the different signs of the and techniques that the goldsmiths were using. This is a particular favorite of mine. It seems to be a female, uh, a female uh, Raksasa. Uh, it's not quite sure. Uh, she's very, she's at ease, but at the same time, extremely menacing with her grin. It's also extremely old. You can, you can have it like Netsky's Chris handles have that from being held in the hand and, and being exposed to the sweat and the oil of the human body can, especially the ivory ones, get these extraordinary patina on, on them and the wear. Uh, and they, they have such a magical feeling with it. I was even told one time by uh, an expert to Chris, a mystical man at one moment, is that the handles were very important because as we know, the iron blades are the most in, considered the most sacred part of the Chris, the heart of the Chris, if you like. But they said that if you didn't have the handle, the correct handle on the blade, that the blade could cause harm to the to the owner. And this is one of the reasons that he said that the Madripite Chris's, the Chris's that there's the iron figure on top of it should be handled with great, great, great care. Now, if you look at this particular form, you can see, uh, you can see close, uh, close comparisons with, with, with the Hindu Buddhist sculpture of, 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 uh, of Java. Uh, particularly in East Java, because we talk about the, from moving from single sari to Majapahit, which was a continuum, and then the late Javanese uh, period, which is a period in which there were a lot of different things coming, and then you had the sort of influence of, of Islam that also came, came in. This is another uh, early Javanese handle uh, of, of, a, of a type of dragon dog or of some sort. You see uh, that he's holding something that looks a little bit like a Kayangan uh, mountain in the crook of his, of his elbow. And always, you know, with this looking up with this menacing, but at the same time, uh, you know, very secure. And we have to realize that Many of these are connected to Vajrayana Buddhism, and that all of them, like Bhairava, many people I know who've written about Chris's have, have 
describes certain uh, of them as Bhairava, who was in fact a Shivite deity, but who was considered an incarnation of Shiva, but who is also, was also adopted by the Buddhists. That was particularly by Kartanagara in the, in, the, in the end of the 13th century in when he merged the two religions, Shiva, the worship of Shiva and, and Tantric Buddhism into one. And many of the practices were the same and they, they played roles as guardians because they were meant to protect and this, these are the ferocious and the wrathful forms of the deities and, and also of the particular uh, demons that they depict for, to scare away those who wish to cause harm and other things. You get other unusual things because when this, this particular collection is quite small, there are only 59 hilts and seven, seven, seven chrises. And it was begun in 1999 as a kind of uh, whimsical thing because uh, Claudia Huntington and her, her, her husband, Marshall Miller, decided that they, uh, they liked Indonesian art when they were visiting here for the first time and started buying uh, a few things here and there. And over the years, they began to uh, be exposed to uh, all sorts of things. And they showed a particular affinity towards beautiful sculpture, the fineness of the, of the, of the carving, the, also the uniqueness of some of them, and uh, particularly the royal ones. And I think that it was a very, very good time for them. Because if you look at most uh, Chris Handel collections, at least traditionally, it was a bit like collecting uh, specimens for, for, for uh, you know, a, bot a botanist or something like that. And they wanted one, at least one specimen of every species from, you know, for, from every particular island. And oftentimes, in my opinion, wrongly attributing or limiting the places of origin to the first place where they found something and said, oh, it must, it must, be, must be from there because that's the first place we, it was, was seen or identified by somebody, but it might have moved there from other places because one, one thing that I've learned in all, over the decades in Indonesia is that things have been moving around for centuries, if not millennium and beyond. This piece, which uh, I'd, I've seen somewhat similar ones, has the winged horse. It's from Madura. And these little, these little strings that you go across, they're actually, they're actually ivory. Uh, and it's 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 quite a unique piece, especially with its form. Here too, we have a, a late colonial piece from Madura as well. And it's you at the same time you can see with the hair connections with the the earlier uh, Raksasa demon ones. You can see this typical with the three arrows, which was was from uh, from also the colonial. Many of the buildings you can see that as a motif all over the place. You see the Dutch uh, this Dutch lion uh, in the center with a crown, and it's flanked by horses, which is uh, of course different. And on the corners of the shoulders of the of the beautiful woman you'll see two angels because of, again, another form of Western, Western influence in, in, in this coming along. This is a truly classical cherubon style handle, uh, again, with, uh, with the, the Raksasa demon. But you can see that it's begun probably from Islamic influence to begin to bury the human form in, in foliage and, and arabesques and other things, perhaps because of the influence of the Sufism at that time, which, which eventually would end up with the abstraction of these human forms to sometimes the point where they look like animals and so on. 
This is, uh, is a particularly powerful uh, uh, Balinese, Balinese uh, handle decorated with gold. It's also, it has spinel. These are not rubies, but spinel. Uh, and, and, uh, and diamond splinters are what they call incon he here. And it might be a, a depiction of, of Bhairava. And uh, you can see all the attributes uh, because they're considered royal, royal beings and princes. And they're the same ones that are in all the Hindu and Buddhist myths that, that you read about all the time. Uh, so I, I think, you know, because of probably serendipity that the collection has a large number of royal chrises, uh, which are made of gold and silver and other precious things. And outside, for example, the lumbar cord, which is uh, which was for a long time in in Holland, but has been returned to to Indonesia since, and is now in the National Museum. Uh, the the number of gold chrises in many many collections is limited. That's that's for several reasons. One of the reasons is that I think gold gold is just intrinsically expensive so it was beyond uh, beyond the means of, of, of many many collectors the second thing is that I've seen that uh, this this sort of bifurcation in 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 what people have collected that there's uh, there are those who don't like gold crystals that much that they associate them more with uh, later later uh, cultures or uh, or not, not as not as powerful as as the early ivory ones. Uh, even though they're very, very closely related and not necessarily uh, young at all. Here's another wood, which is inlaid with uh, diamond splinters and has uh, has a, a brass cup under underneath, which is related to the ones with the flying horses. This is another uh, interesting uh, and rare type of handle, uh, which is found from Banjar Masin. You see the demon here is much thinner. And we have to remember that all these demons, that they were, they were not just demons, that we've forgotten many of their names. Uh, uh, because if you look, I know if you try to study uh, Bali, uh, Balinese esoteric magic, they have hundreds of names from the different different types of demons and and what spells they cast and what influences they could do and how to evoke them through various kinds of uh, uh, rituals and and offerings and other other things. And unfortunately, one of the things that's happened in 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 the last uh, you know fifty years is that. Much of that esoteric knowledge has been lost, just like the esoteric knowledge which surrounded the Pande caste, who had all their own secret words for the tools of trade that they used, for the techni techniques they used, because they considered uh, metal to be alive and that you had to sacrifice something because when you worked it, it was magically dangerous and could end up uh, causing death and disease and other, other uh, terrible uh, events. This is a particularly uh, uh, pleasing type of, of minangkabau, the Sumatran, of course, you, Chris's, you find from, from many places uh, as, uh, uh, from southern Thailand to to uh, Borneo and beyond, and this is from Agam, and I always think of Brancusi sculptures when I see it. Uh, one thing I was going to say that was really funny, and this is also true of the blades that you see in uh, in the the crystals of Makassar, is that people said, "Oh, why aren't why aren't they clean, and why don't we see the Pamor?" In fact. They had their own tradition of, 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 of iron forging and that their blades were very rarely, uh, you know, had the pattern, the Pomor thing that many, many people are so fascin fascinated by, by from the nickel, the, 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 the folding of nickel into, into the iron. And oftentimes 
uh, in my experience, is the blades are left left uh, left as they are, and that and that a few times I've seen people who have cleaned, for instance, the blades of Makasa Chris. And um, and they've been scolded by people from Makassar because they say you shouldn't shouldn't do that. This is not a Chris. Uh, it's from Bima Sumbawa, which is of course the Bugenese people. Who it's a it's a it's a court that was set up by the Bugenese people, and it's it's clearly related to another uh, another dagger. Which is uh, which is in the National Museum, which has a human figure of, a figure about it. In this case, we can only wonder about who this uh, Noah-like uh, surprise man in the mouth of the Naga dragon is, with with the scales going going up. Very very beautiful uh, example. You can see here. And these zigzag patterns. You also see from the boogies, the boogies uh, seem to have learned a great deal that has to do with the use of also of filigree and other things from the Minangkabau. And because they were, they were in fact uh, converted to Islam by, by uh, Minang Minangkabau proselytizers early in the seven, 17th century. Uh, a few of them wanted to become, there was almost, it came that close for them to become Christians, but it did not happen. This is, this is also, these, these handles, the actual handle at the top, this part there, is uh, it's cast. And one of the things that you see in the oldest handles is that they are they are fully cast in Balinese handles? They're gray poussé. What happens is that they are they're shaped and then they're welded together. Now here they have cutouts and other decorations that they put upon the center center figure, uh, and these pieces are are among the earliest identify of viable chrises that you can see. And it's quite amazing because there was no Hindu Buddhist kingdom on Sulawesi uh, that, that it's, there was so much influence uh, from the iconography that you see here with these, with these bird-like figures. And this one is clearly some, some hero, perhaps Arjuna. That you can see on the horse. So to uh, to go back again, uh, I, I I you know I want to open it up for for a discussion. If anybody has any sort of sort of questions, is that th the purpose of this particular book was more aesthetic rather than uh, than uh, and sculptural to to show the show the the distinctions and i also i was also very fascinated uh, uh, by by the by the the sumptuous of all these royal chrises and how they also related to the regalia and many other gold objects would come come out. Now it's interesting if you look at there are a number of hilts which have come out of Java gold hilts which are are from the classical Hindu Buddhist period, none of which look like uh, Chris Chris handles as we know them. Uh, and even though on the Borobudur temple there is one uh, there's one relief that has something that looks like the, a, a Chris. My my feeling is that it's probably more likely a sword of some some type, and that the earliest uh, you, weapons that 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 are clearly curses, which are stabbing stabbing weapons, and they have uh, from from one side, are the ones that are seen in Ch Chandi Supu, the 15th century ones in Chandi Supu, and the curses as we know them appeared during the Sinosari and and the uh, and the Majapite Empire. And this is also this is also supported because in the Brantas River in in the in the 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 nineteen nineties and also in and from two thousand to two thousand and ten, there were a number of 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 
Chris and with, with, uh, with handles, usually from deer horn and other things, which were clearly very, very early that came out. Uh, unfortunately, because iron, everything that's iron deteriorates much, much more quickly, very few of them have intact blades, but those blades begin to resemble more the Chris's as, as we know, know them. And, and I, uh, I want to thank, you know, some other people I would like to thank, uh, you know, as, as collectors, uh, there's Cedric Dauphin, there was also, uh, you know, uh, quite, quite a few other people. There was Hans uh, Witzenberg, uh, who he also put together, I think it was like 800 Chris handles. He had extraordinary pieces. He also had a lot of uh, what I would call just standard examples of a particular, particular type because he wanted to cover all bases. Uh, I also was very intrigued by the, by the, uh, the uh, explorations of New and Comp about whom I, I read a book and, 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 and what he discovered and saw about Chris's particularly the Kusia, the one that everybody thought was horse, but ended up being a, 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 an insect lar larvae. And then you can see also with some of the other handles that if you look in the book, because there are many, many more uh, uh, examples in the book for you to look at. So at that point, I would like to turn it back over to Finette. So if anybody has any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Yeah.